Once upon a time, in Paris and New York, there was a band of maybe 20 or 30 people who controlled our images, our collective understanding of the way we thought of the world. The editors in those days really were running the show. John was the DNA of some of the greatest moments in history and he was instrumental in assigning the photographers to parts of our history which will live on forever. My ambition was to get a job on Life magazine. I loved working with pictures. I finally got a job as an office boy at Time Inc. in November 1938, $20 a week. I continued working for life until 1946 when I quit to become a picture editor at Ladies Home Journal. I was picture editor for six years and then Coppa came to New York and said, how about joining us, meaning Magnum. So he offered me a job as the international executive editor. It's a title we made up at the bar of the Oak Room in the plaza. My interests in a way coincided with Robert Coppa's even though he was born on the left bank of the Danube and I was born in, in New Jersey and raised on the south side of Chicago. We were kind of buddies without saying so. Uh, I've always referred to him as my adopted brother. In those days, it was so different. You really knew the personality of the photographer and you knew what the assignment would entail. So you would match that. Bob Kappa was perfect for Omaha for the D-Day landings. D-Day was Tuesday, June 6, 1944. I was in London. The bulletin came over BBC that Allied forces had landed somewhere in France. Our deadline was Thursday morning at 9 a.m. from Grosvenor Square. We waited all day, and there was no word from, from the front at all. And then we waited again on Wednesday, and still nothing. Finally, about 6 o'clock, a phone call said, this film is coming by courier. We were under terrible deadline pressure. The whole world was waiting. It wasn't long before an almost hysterical darkroom lad named Dennis Banks, not Larry Burroughs, came rushing into my office and said, John, the films are all ruined. I said, what do you mean? He said, you were in such a hurry. Uh, I put the film in the drying cabinet and the emulsion ran. So I ran back to the darkroom with him and I held up the films one at a time. And the first three rolls, there was nothing, it was just pea soup. But on the fourth roll, there were 11 frames that, that had images. Uh, we, we printed every single one. Here's the lead. That's what we had waited nine months to do. It was not an ideal choice for the lead picture, but it was okay. This is going to Normandy. This is coming back with the wounded. It was a horrible trip. There were people dying left and right in, the, in this group. How many people can actually rewalk a beach that Kappa walked on in Normandy, as I did with John a year or so ago. And at the end of our very short walk together, he looked up and he said, all of my life has been so braided with the fate of Robert Kappa, and I never really understood until I rewalked it. I knew all the founders of Magnum before Magnum started. I was Magnum's first American customer in the first year of Magnum. I think the income of the New York office was something like uh, $40,000, and I think $36,000 came from the Ladies Home Journal. <laughs> the Ladies Home Journal gave me an opportunity to broaden my outlook on, on photojournalism because we had one important assignment to give out each month for $1,500 plus expenses to the best photographers I could think of. I would try to match the photographer to the subject. So it was like awarding a Pulitzer Prize every month. <laughs> it was fun. The people 
he knew and admired and who were his friends in the world of photography, Henri Cartier-Bresson, Gordon Parks, W. Gene Smith. These are giants that he met over a period of time. This cannot be by accident. This is fabulous stuff. I, I don't remember these pictures of Picasso. Oh, how I'd love to, to re-edit all this stuff. The only thing that's important is if you come back with the picture. I don't think that he would have titled his book, Get the Picture, if it hadn't been the most significant factor in his life. He could say, that one, and suddenly we have a Nick Oot photograph that changes the way we think of the Vietnam War. He could say, that one, Eugene Smith is going to Appalachia. He's such an extraordinary historian of the world of photography and beyond the world of photography. He can understand and explain history because he can place himself in time and space. And he's an extraordinary educator in that sense. I think some people would believe that uh, at John's stage of life, that he would be a conservative gentleman sitting comfortably at home. He is not. He's the first person I know who mentioned Barack Obama as being possibly the next president of the United States. He campaigned ferociously for him. The state of the world discourages me. Uh, and I keep asking myself the question, what can we do to create a more sane, creative world? I still think photography uh, images have an enormous role to play. He was married three times. He outlived everybody. He's outliving everybody, actually. It's amazing, but his mind is so fresh. That is what is extraordinary. He's in love again. He's in love. To hear somebody in their 90s say, these are the happiest years of my life, it's just wonderful. It teaches all of us a lesson. I find it quite moving to see how strong his love of life is and how intense his optimism is in terms of what human beings could do to make the world a better place. He still believes it's possible.